Namaste. Welcome to a new webinar in our series of Health and Well-Being. In this program, Yoga for Unity and Well-Being, 100 Days Towards the International Day of Yoga, this week we will be celebrating the World Health Day. It falls on the 7th of April and this year the United Nations has declared the theme of building a fairer and healthier world. We've all seen how during these COVID times, healthcare has been very difficult to provide to several communities around the world. While some of us have been benefiting from so much from the caregivers, health workers, there are communities around the world that have very little access to healthcare. In times of such inequalities, it's difficult to make up our minds how to help them and if at all it is possible. To discuss this and to see what are the different ways in which we can come to the aid and solve differences in healthcare around the world and celebrate health and wellness, let's have with us three international speakers who are experts in the field of health but in very different ways. So let's listen to all of these three discuss between them how healthcare can create a fairer and a more beautiful world. Hello everyone and welcome to this wonderful webinar for World Health Day, which is tomorrow on April 7th. We have an, a magical program for you. Both our guests today have spent their working lives bringing spiritual solace and well-being using different methods and tools for both health, health professionals and their patients. The WHO's theme for this year for 2021 for World Health Day is building a fairer, healthier world. And these two wonderful professionals are both going to take us beyond the medical model in this discussion. First, I'll introduce them. We have Chaplain Elizabeth Berger, who is a speaker and consultant in narrative medicine and spiritual health. She is well known for her education programs for healing health professionals. She's also the founder of the Burnout Chaplain in New York City, and she's on various faculties, does a lot of professional work within the medical industry. Specifically, she's on the faculty at the Donald and Barbara Zucker School of Medicine, and is also an educator at Northwell Health. Welcome, Elizabeth. Thank you so much for having me. We also have Dr. Jay Timapuram, a dear, dear friend of mine, somebody who I value so much, is an academic hospitalist in internal medicine at Wellspan York Hospital in Pennsylvania. And he's very interested, he's passionate about, I would say, research and research into well-being in the health industry. He has various accolades, including the Gold Humanism Award, and various awards for being outstanding teacher and resident of the year. And his main focus is on research on heartfulness meditation and its effect on lowering stress and burnout and improving sleep. He also conducts stress management workshops using heartfulness practices for professionals, healthcare professionals and patients. And uh, he's a TEDx speaker as well. They're both human beings, of course, despite all these grand accolades. Elizabeth is, has this interesting background of being a board certified chaplain, and yet her background is secular, it's scientific, which I'm sure must have posed its own challenges earlier on in life, although the fields of science and spirituality are definitely merging much more today. And Dr. J has a very, very busy, normal family life. His wife is also a hospitalist. They have two young kids and a puppy, so I'm sure they're both very, very busy. But I also want to find out a little bit more, something interesting about you. So just as an, an odd question, can you both share with us a job that no one knows you've had? Elizabeth, would you like to start? No one ever believes it, but I used to sell cars and I never <laughs> lied. I sold cars, but I never lied to customers. Uh, it was a very, very interesting experience. And it really, 
uh, serve me in chaplaincy because you really need to find out what people's requirements are and what their wants are and how they see themselves in their cars. Uh, there's a lot of connection to, to, to healthcare. So uh, it was actually, uh, I always say that no experience is ever wasted and that, that that's included, I would say. Yeah. What about you, Dr. J? Well, I've always been uh, in the medical profession, but something that I wanted to share is that before I even started um, working as a, as, a, as a physician after training, medical training, right? I stayed with a couple. Uh, those are my brother's friends in the UK. And I just wanted to convey my gratitude because I stayed with them for almost uh, close to seven or eight months with them, the way they took care of me, the way they paved a path for my career. It's almost uh, as if some, um, some things you cannot pay back except to thank them from the bottom of your heart for everything that they have done to pave the path for who you are at this point. Okay, wonderful. Thank you, both of you. So let's dive into the questions now because you're both experts in this field. Elizabeth, can we start with you? The question is, what are some of the greatest challenges to well-being among healthcare professionals today? Not just specifically yeah. COVID, but obviously COVID is there as well. COVID has brought it to a new level, but even before COVID, I would say the, the, the two greatest challenges are burnout. Uh, which is a frequently used term, and also moral injury. They are different. Uh, burnout refers to um, challenges to one's um, sense of meaning in medicine, a, a, a lowered sense of personal satisfaction, cynicism, which is sometimes called uh, depersonalization, and emotional exhaustion. It differs from moral injury in that moral injury has more to do with engaging uh, or, or participating in acts that violate one's personal moral beliefs or um, a sense of betrayal by an authority, perhaps someone you report to, um, a betrayal by someone who is alleged to have shared moral values. And you can see where, where COVID would, would, you know, would, would, would certainly uh, put people in a position that, you know, that, that's extremely challenging. Uh, but those, and then, and then under the umbrella of those two constructs, there are things, you know, we hear very frequently that people are very frustrated with the electronic health record and, you know, all of these uh, uh, environmental and organizational kinds of things that feed into, you know, the, those, those two constructs. But those, I would say, are the, the main umbrellas that encompass, you know, uh, things that challenge well-being among healthcare professionals. Right. And what about spiritual health? You know, you're not just focusing on the medical model here. You're bringing another dimension into this in your work. How does it differ from mental health and how does it impact these challenges? So mental health, for the first time really, is beginning to get some traction in the medical world. One of the last events I was able to attend in person before um, the, 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 shut, the lockdown just several months earlier was uh, a first ever conference on medical student mental health and well-being in New York. Uh, it was fine. It was uh, facilitated by um, Weill Cornell. Um, and so there's a growing an amount of emphasis on uh, mental health. Mental health refers to emotional and psychological well-being. Spiritual health is a component, uh, a frequently overlooked one, uh, a component of emotional and psychological well-being. Um, and I, if I may, I, I, I have a slide because the, I have a, a de definition, a consensus definition that I very frequently rely upon to explain um, what spiritual health is because it may or may not include religious practice, so. Sure, please go ahead. So, so this is a, a, a literature review uh, it includes um, the definition of spirituality um, that was the consensus definition from a 2009 article in the Journal of Palliative Care. And so 
This definition, which distinguishes it from religion, spirituality is the aspect of humanity that refers to the way individuals seek and express meaning and purpose and the way they experience their connectedness to the moment, to self, to others, to nature and to the significant or sacred. So you can see this is an all encompassing kind of definition and irrespective of what someone's religious or irreligious belief system is, there's room for everyone. And so uh, this is the definition that I, that, that I use when explaining what spiritual health is to people who are um, unfamiliar with it. And you can see the connection to alleviating some of the facets of burnout because we're going straight to the issue of meaning and purpose, which is why we're all here, you know, and especially in medicine uh, where there's a calling, right? So that's yes, um, Okay, so then we're looking at how this impacts. How does this relate to well-being amongst healthcare professionals? I know you've said, I, I want you to go into it in a little bit more detail in terms of say day to day, you know, how does being connected affect your well-being in a general sense? So there are ways to connect on an organizational level and there are ways to connect on an individual level, right? So there are, you know, well-being and self-care practices that inform your practice in, in healthcare. And then there are organizational, like I said, components. Some of the barriers to meaning making in medicine are cultural within medicine. One of them is sort of a stoic ideal of medical professionalism that you know, varies from, from culture to culture, but certainly exists here in the US, a perception of secularism as being inherently neutral. And by this, I mean that um, the assumption that everyone is served and no one is injured by talking about God or spirituality. Um, and that's pretty pervasive as well. Um, and then the third is, you know, and again, this varies geographically, but there is a, an artifact from the 20th century that is sort of lingering, and that is an association of spirituality with anti-intellectualism. This is a very evidence-based culture, right? And there's an association of professional embarrassment with this. And, and um, it, it's really, it, it, it's, it's part of a very big disconnect because statistically, we see that um, physicians and other healthcare professionals have, you know, a spiritual life internally, but they can't necessarily bring it to work. And there isn't a lot of encouragement to talk about it. And so there's sort of this splintering of the self. There are these two selves, you know, one is the, the people who have gone to school for 11 years to become physicians and they want to be taken seriously, right? And then the other, the other part of them that, you know, has, you know, has like this hidden uh, internal life. And it affects not just them, but their ab ability to, you know, to connect to their patients who are sometimes in the biggest trouble of their lives. Daniel Salmazi at the Kennedy Institute very famously said that, you know, illness is a spiritual event. And so you have this scientific discipline that's conflated with a spiritual event and how do we traverse and, 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 and bridge those kinds of gaps. So it's a problem. Yeah. Dr. J, have you got anything to add to that from your own experience? Sure. Um, with regards to the well-being of any human being, and if we take the medical professionals into consideration, right, there is a lot that we go through. Uh, and, and it's one of those professions where you see a higher degree of uh, burnout. There is talk of moral injury more often in healthcare professionals. The emotional state of people that uh, as, as a healthcare professional that we deal with, right? You have people who are sick, who are looking for hope. And sometimes it may not be possible to do what is necessary and Sometimes it may not be possible because of the whole circumstance or the limitations that we have as physicians. And all this does play a role in what we carry as the baggage, the, the, the result of everything that happens, the inner wear and tear of life, right? 
and this inner wear and tear slowly affects uh, affects everyone and healthcare professionals are not an exception to it mm. when that inner wear and tear goes on for a long period of time right the the meaningfulness and purpose of life slowly starts to fade away and how do we address this and one of the things that we wanted to explore is whether practices such as meditation offer some relief right the the approach has to be multi pronged there have there has to be an organizational approach to see how these things can be tackled and also a personal approach as uh, elizabeth was mentioning and it is the personal approach that we wanted to explore to see if uh, if if these practices have an impact i am a i am an academic hospitalist i i teach residents i work with them and residents are very dear to my heart and at such an engage uh, where their career is developing right the work hours that they do uh and the emotional stress the ups and downs that they go through somehow creates a long term impact and even if we look at the way our patients approach the healthcare professionals right i often find this very interesting our patients like medical students much more <laughs> you know the the ability to sit with a patient the ability to connect with a patient right it is much more obvious at the level of a medical student and i see that the, the, the faces of our patients they brighten up the moment we say hey we have our medical students here and they smile and they look for this medical student so what happens as one finishes the medical school one goes through a training program and one becomes a physician i think this inner uh, disconnect i think elizabeth was mentioning it very well when she gave the definition of uh, Uh, spirituality right it is it is in some ways it is also about that inner connection of um, that of something that may not be very tangible right and that inner connection if it is stronger if that inner connection is flowing to the outside then it becomes easier to navigate through ups and downs of life but if there is a disconnect at some level then this inner Uh, friction the inability to manifest who we are deep within ourselves is something that would play a role in the phenomenon of burnout in the phenomenon of moral injury and how do we manifest who we are to the outside world as we are in the deepest core of our own hearts so this is probably one of the main questions that we want to explore and see if we are able to reestablish that deeper connection with oneself by offering an inner environment that is congenial for that connection okay so both of you have touched very much now on patient centered care and the fact that what's going on at the spiritual level the spiritual health of professionals is affecting this so elizabeth you know can you share as us share with us this concept of you know what is meant by the expression you cannot pour from an, an empty cup what has this got to do with compassion fatigue and burnout so um it's well I, let me say first that long before there was a pandemic it has been well established in the medical uh, literature for many years that there is absolutely a connection between clinician well-being and patient's perception of care So it's interesting what you're saying Jay about Dr. Jay about the um the medical students you know in that level of attention um and the quality of care. I mean there there's absolutely a connection to medical error which is a controversial statistic but it's it's a it's it's a leading cause of death at least here in the US. So when we think about pouring from an empty cup there are things about my training in chaplaincy that I think would be so valuable um in other disciplines not that we should export an entire pedagogy from one place to the other but you know the business of self care is a requirement it is a professional standard within my discipline you cannot be uh recertified 
as a chaplain in some places, uh, if you have not demonstrated every five years to a board of your peers that you have been engaged in self-care. I mean, this is treated as continuing education credit. This is, this is considered very, very serious business. And so that, 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 uh, that ethic that you can't pour from an empty cup really comes from that part of my training. And I think that every discipline in some way could, I think every, every career could benefit from that in some way. Um, where it gets confusing from, for people with respect to empathy is that there is an expectation that if you are professional and you are caring and you're kind, that you should have endless capacity, right? To show up for the other, to show up for your patient. And I compare that to what our expectations are of, sur of surgeons. You know, being a surgeon is very physically demanding. It requires uh, an enormous stamina, right? Uh, it's, it requires a kind of athleticism because they might have to be in a procedure for an extended period of time, right? Could anyone think that surgeons should have endless capacity to stand on their feet? No, that's preposterous. And the same is true of empathy because empathy can be thought of as uh, emotional athleticism. Some people have more, some people have less, like any kind of uh, emotional intelligence we're, we're, we're capable of growing, growing that skill, right? Uh, but the idea that we should have endless capacity to hold the suffering for people who are often in the worst trouble of their lives consistently is, is a misconception. Mm -hmm. I think of it as um, a two reservoir system, right? So ideally one tank is full and one tank is empty. The full tank is what we bring to bear, right? It's what motivated us to go into healthcare. It's our training, it's our expertise. It's our skill, it's our caring, it's what we engage in in self-care behind the scenes that, so that we can show up for others, right? And ideally the other tank is an empty vessel with which we contain the suffering of others, right? And so I think that reflective practice, whether it be you know, uh, meditation, mindful practice, or narrative medicine, all of these things work in two ways. One is it helps to clear that space so that we can receive others, right? But we also grow in self-awareness and anything that helps us grow in self-awareness, you develop a better set of gauges and, and you, you have a better sense of where those the status of those tanks, right? We don't wait until the, the, the receiving tank is full to overflowing. You, you build stamina because you're aware that it's up to here and you're having a really hard day, right? And, you, and you're thinking about how you're going to engage in self-care because this tank is getting very full. And, you know, sometimes maybe the right thing to do for everyone is, is to come back another day. And, and th those things do happen sometimes. So if we think about it in those ways, you have a dynamic that, you know, that you can engage in self-care with that is better for patients, better for the environment, and I think better for the individual. Yeah. So Elizabeth, how has COVID impacted all this? Has it exacerbated the situation? Yes, it has. So I've been engaged. Uh, I've been very fortunate. I, I've been engaged in, with a research project with a team at Duke University. Uh, we actually have an article in press uh, in the Journal of nervous and mental disease, and that's pending. We looked at uh, moral injury and burnout among healthcare professionals during COVID-19. This was a mixed method study, uh, two, two cross-sectional studies. And um, it's, it's challenging. It's really challenging. What we saw in the data, you know, some people are uh, more likely to experience moral injury. It's more likely, apparently, if you're young, if you are um, single, widowed, or divorced, if you're a nurse, right? These are the things that we, that, that we saw in the data. And what's really telling is what we saw um, in the qualitative data about just how disruptive this has been, not just to the work environment, but to the rhythms of people's daily lives. I'll give you an example. You know, before the pandemic, people might not have thought twice about running an errand before work wearing scrubs. 
Now that's unthinkable, right? So just, just, you know, just that idea, I can't run to the bank and deposit a check, right? Wearing scrubs before, you know, before work. Those are the kinds of things that we saw. There are a lot of themes of isolation and alienation, some, so, some sense of betrayal, because I think that systemically we were just so unprepared, you know, for the way this went and fear, you know, fear and fatigue, you know, as time wore, not, wore on. And what, what seems really apparent to me um, is that, you know, we had a problem with burnout before the pandemic, you know, and uh, it's, uh, we're not going to just pick ourselves up and dust ourselves off. You know, this is going to be unfolding uh, for a very long time. I have attended international conferences on burnout. Every country has their statistic on this. In the US, uh, before the pandemic, we were losing 400 physicians a year to, uh, to, to suicide. And it corresponded to a million American patients a year losing a physician to suicide. Uh, and so we need to take this very seriously. And like I you know, said, on individual levels, like the, the work Dr. J is doing, and, and also on an organizational level, you know, um, because some of it, you know, occurred in the, in the environment. You know, it wasn't just what was happening outside work. We're going to need to do something about that going forward. So what can be done? Because obviously there's a need to help sustain spiritual health, the connection that you mentioned in your definition among healthcare professionals, what, what can be done? I think mindful practice, I have some background in that too. And I think that mindful practice is extremely important. I think that people have to find awe where they can and different people will experience that differently. This is actually, it was, it's been studied at Berkeley uh, that people who experience awe and inspiration uh, perform better. They share resources more. They are more motivated to help. They feel more a part of a community. So uh, it's 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 not just you know a feel good strategy. It really does have the potential to pull us all back together again, which is so important. You know, um, you know there are several methodologies. Um, you know, my work is primarily in, in narrative medicine, which was, you know, uh, it was conceived at Columbia University by Dr. Rita Sharon. The overarching goal um, is, is patient-centered care. But like any reflective practice, so, you know, a funny thing happens on the way to the store, you know, any reflective practice winds up benefiting um, the people it's intended to train, right? So, um, so narrative medicine is a set of practices where we use literature traditionally and also other media with reflective writing to deepen awareness and improve relationships in medicine and healthcare. I don't think uh, when this master's program was first offered at Columbia University that Dr. Sharon could ever have imagined um, the role that it would eventually play in the situation we're in. But it's, it's almost tailor-made, I think, for what we're dealing with because um, you can direct um, the, the curricula to uh, specific you know, pedagogical goals and we can see themes emerging from the research that, you know, that I've done with Duke about, you know, where those exercises might go and what those writing prompts might look like. Um, right. And so, 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 so narrative medicine and narrative medicine, I would say, conducted in a very specific way. And that means in a, in a safe, academic, confidential environment, uh, confidentiality can never be stipulated but it can certainly be negotiated. And I think it's important um, that these kinds of uh, programs are facilitated by people who understand something about group process, about how to create you know, safe space, um, and, you know, and who, who are skilled in that. Historically, I have always thought that, you know, any narrative medicine is better than no narrative medicine. And there are plenty of clinicians who have done weekend workshops and you know, brought the tenets of narrative medicine to their institutions. But in the situation we're in, I think that you really need uh, people who are you know, skilled in this kind of group facilitation to, to hold those spaces. And every institution 
has people like that. It's just a matter of identifying what the resources are in each of those institutions. And if I may, I can show you a little bit of what that might look like. That would be great, yes, yes, please. So this is an example of a painting that I used as a narrative medicine stimulus with the staff of a single center dialysis unit. Um, the painting is called The Dead Mother by the artist Edvard Munch. Um, he lost his own mother to tuberculosis when he was six years old. And I, I offer it as an example of a couple of things. One is um, the, how organic the process of narrative medicine is and how it can help um, individuals um, begin to recover from their experience of COVID-19. Um, this, this is the kind of thing that we share in small group environments. We would have an opportunity to discuss the painting. Uh, and then we would write to the prompt that I prepared for the session, which was right about a time when you felt overwhelmed. I had every expectation, again, this was uh, pre-COVID-19, I had every expectation that uh, the participants would discuss uh, the experience of working with patients who frequently face life-threatening illness. Um, I had an education working in this dialysis unit because when you're not a medical clinician, uh, kidney disease seems so much more located than it actually is. I found out from this project that uh, when your kidneys are sick, everything's sick. It's extremely complicated. Um, and so, uh, I had an expectation that we would talk about, you know, the turnover in uh, working in a dialysis unit and, um, and the life-threatening illness that their patients faced. Uh, instead, this became uh, a session about the stress that they experienced during snow days and how difficult it is, is to arrange last minute childcare and how last minute the decision frequently is to close a single center dialysis unit because that kind of decision is extremely serious. Um, it creates a rescheduling cascade uh, and they frequently you know, have let almost no notice uh, and the rest of the world is closed because it's a snow emergency and they have to get to work. And it, it brought them to tears even you know, having these conversations. And it was so interesting and so moving to see people across disciplines sitting around a table, sharing these experiences of you know, missing out when their children are at home at someone else's house, making a snowman, you know, that kind of a thing. So again, very organic uh, outcome uh, from, the, from the exercise that I devised. I would expect if I ran this exercise now, almost certainly um, the focus would be people's experiences in the hospital during COVID. Um, and, and that's what this kind of work does. It provides an opportunity for these stories to unfold. And this is an important tenet of narrative medicine that illness unfolds in stories. We go to the doctor, we tell the doctor the story of what happened and how, the, how you came, they came to seek medical treatment. And I think that the same can be said of COVID-19, that the experiences that people had are going to unfold in stories. And this kind of work gives them the opportunity to be heard, which is the most important thing chaplains do. We are not trained to preach to the sick about God, which is a common misconception. We are trained to read the subtitles of human interaction and, and make people feel heard and, and accompanied by doing that. And so that's the function of this kind of work. So, the, so feeling attended to, feeling heard, being recognized for the experiences they've had during this very difficult time, I think is one part of the equation. And the other is what we had discussed earlier about cultivating a sense of inspiration and awe. And we can do that on the organizational level too. And I've brought an example of that. And I'll share that now. We are on Earth and the Earth is just one planet in the galaxies. You can compare that to an ant on on the patio in this backyard. The ant doesn't know that there's more than the patio here. He just keeps walking. He doesn't know he there's he's just part of a hu of lots of worlds. And the human race is sort of like that. They after they've discovered 
What's up there? They know they're only a little part of this huge galaxy. I think there probably are many different kinds of life forms, cells and organisms. Some may not be visible, some may not have been discovered, and some may be on places we can't go. And they all might have the same perspective as we do on this, that there might be others and that maybe they can find them someday, but at the moment, they don't know. You never know for sure if there really is anything in the search. It's just, it's an endless quest without knowing what your quest is. I think it's realistic at the same time as it is fantas fantasyful. Yeah, it's just very complicated mm. because you have no proof that there's any, that there's anything out there. The only proof is yourself right. and where you are in the universe and that and you can only make theories. You can never know the truth. That's one of the hardest questions there is. There's I would say what the meaning of your life is is what you make it. What yeah. you think what you want your life to be. Nobody can decide what you will do except for you. You have in control over yourself. You See, may well, not be lucky enough and the odds may be against you, but so you there's never a definite no that you cannot do this. It may be predestined, but you can change that destiny. Oh, well that's tricky. But it's good to know. I mean, it, I might be wrong. It might be just scheduled like some play or something and you act it not knowing that you're part of it ah. but but all the same maybe destiny's just telling you maybe you don't have you just know it and that's what destiny is destiny is a guess a guess of what you know what it knows about you and what it knows you would do what you but then again, I might be wrong, and destiny could be totally in control of you. So I'll stop it there. But you can see that he models so well, you know, such a supreme tolerance of what lies in the shadow of our epistemological grasp, right? <laughs> he doesn't claim to have, no, have all the answers. He doesn't think that we're necessarily in control. He just rolls with it. And it's just, you know, it's, it's just such a great way to start this kind of conversation in uh, among adults who very much like to be in control, right? Um, so that's an example of uh, a program that we did. So, so, so there's, those are a couple of examples of, you know, how narrative medicine can be implemented in this kind of context. And I think that over time, it's just like meditation practice over time, you know, you assemble these moments into a mosaic and they sustain you. You know, uh, and they uh, they're, they're, there's a significant amount of evidence now. I'll actually share a slide. Um, there was right before the pandemic, actually, there was a um, a, a literature review in the British Medical Journal. Um, it's an and then programming has already has resulted in a range of positive outcomes for health science professionals. And this includes mitigating burnout, uh, team building, uh, sense of well-being, you know, a full literature review. So the evidence is now there. It's a, a narrative medicine cannot compare its history to meditation practice. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's a little more than a decade old as opposed to many thousands of years, but it is going quite well. So, um, uh, it's extremely promising. And I'm glad we have it, uh, particularly given our current state of affairs. Yeah, that's amazing. And you know, I'd, I'd definitely like to know more about the, the results of that. So you can share them with us after this. Great. Dr. J, can you talk a little bit about your perspective of how spiritual health can be supported amongst healthcare professionals from your research and your experience also in terms of meditation practices? 
Sure. Thank you, Elizabeth, for that question. And thank you, Elizabeth, for, for all the uh, wisdom that you have shared about the narrative medicine. And as we talked about earlier, there are many, many approaches to wellness. There are many approaches to improve the inner state that each one carries within oneself, right? And the practices of training the mind is what this meditation simply is all about. And many people approach meditative practices for various reasons. The meditative practices can be approached from a wellness point of view. It can be approached from a spiritual point of view. And the practices can be approached from a scientific point of view, right? And being on the medical side, the approach would be to see whether this is replicable. If we offer a simple practice that has the meditative approach, can we replicate the results? Does it offer benefit? So this is the question with which we started some of our studies in our hospital. One of the things that we did was we offered a simple heart-based meditation practice called heartfulness to physicians, to nurses, and our resident physicians for about 12 weeks. And the practice that we offered was very simple. And it is based on this fact that if we are able to consciously rest our mind for a specific period of time, and if we're able to have some support from a trainer, if we're able to also provide some tools and techniques to remove the emotional baggage that one carries, does it help? So this is based on the, the practices of heartfulness. And when we offered this for 12 weeks, we saw that uh, the emotional exhaustion that uh, Elizabeth Chaplin, that you talked about, the emotional exhaustion decreased, the feelings of cynicism decreased, and the third element, which is the personal accomplishment, right? And the perception of personal accomplishment also improved in the group that went through 12 weeks of heartfulness meditation practice compared to the control group that carried on as usual with availability of services such as EAP which is the Employee Assistance Program. In that study, we also wanted to see if uh, something objective can be measured. And in that, for that, what we did was we collected salivary samples of our participants to measure their telomere length. And telomeres are basically cap-like structures at the tip of our chromosomal DNA. And in general, if they are a healthier lifestyle would reflect in a healthy longer telomere and an unhealthy lifestyle can sometimes shorten the telomere length. And it is also linked with longevity. And I think it goes hand in hand that a, a healthy lifestyle and longevity are related, right? What we wanted to see was if the practices of heartfulness meditation has an effect on the telomere length. And it was very interesting when we found out the results. If we look at uh, what happened to our participants, right? At baseline, we measured the telomere length and at the end of 12 weeks, we measured the telomere length again. In the group that went through heartfulness meditation practice, we saw that in the younger population, especially the telomere length increased with statistical significance with the control group showing not much of a change. So this tells us that there is something objectively as well that happens that may be reflecting as an improved symptom of burnout within healthcare professionals. The other thing that we also uh, offered was to see if it would, if it would improve uh, loneliness, for instance, right? Loneliness is, uh, is, is a silent epidemic and healthcare professionals are also uh, one of the lonely bunch, if you want to call them. Uh, there is some data showing that uh, healthcare professionals are at a higher risk of loneliness too. And when we conducted a four week study, we saw that loneliness scores improved and even their, uh, their sleep scores also improved. And if we are able to provide adequate rest for the mind, if we are able to provide that adequate rest at a very deep level within one's own heart, this also translates into combating that inner feelings of fatigue and burnout. Sometimes the emotional weight that we carry 
can cause that fatigue and once those emotional weights are lifted off then it becomes easier to handle life in a much better way and from a scientific point of view i often wondered how this translates into uh the 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 scientific processes that happen within our body right recently i came up uh, uh with an article that talks about how the rest for the mind improves our well being right and this was a study that was done using sleep as uh, one of the parameters that improve one's well being and they have done studies to see what happens during sleep how does this rest for the mind improve one's well being and there is fluid around the brain the cerebrospinal fluid mm-hmm. and when the mind goes through when the brain goes through this restful stages right when the brain hits the deepest state of rest reflected through the delta waves something magical happens the fluid around the brain flows through the brain clearing up all the toxins that are built up during the daytime and if we look at it from a day to day stresses right sometimes when we are not well rested when we wake up in the morning we feel as if we are looking through fog there is not much clarity and imagine not having that clarity within and we are dealing with emotionally stressful situations and because of that lack of clarity our ability to perform suffers our ability to offer our empathy the, our ability to radiate that inner compassion each and every one has it suffers and if we are able to create that state of resting of the mind through conscious training it would help us in a much more way than what we can imagine at this point sleep is another area that we ventured on because sleep and burnout are related if we don't sleep well it is easier to get burnt out right we offered this practice to our resident physicians for about a week to see what happened to what happens to their sleep and what we found out was that they slept much faster their onset of sleep came down from an average of 21 minutes to an average of 14 and a half minutes their quality of sleep and restfulness improved with statistical significance so these are the practices that we offered for our own healthcare professionals in our organizations to see uh, if it would help and and i'm very happy to share that these practices do offer uh, some help and relief to, uh, to to the inner wear and tear that everyone goes through in their life that's amazing too thank you dr j it sounds to me that this combination of what you're doing elizabeth with narrative medicine and what you're doing jay with heartfulness practices are very synergistic are very complementary uh in the sense that one is dealing with uh, the more outward emotional expression circumstantial situations etc and the inner work is focusing on creating that inner stillness and well-being it's a lovely combination so I want some key takeaways from you both. I'd like to know what you would suggest to health professionals going forward. What what are the next steps in all this? There are obviously tools and techniques that you both have. Can we start with you Dr. Jane we'll finish with you Elizabeth on what would you say is your key takeaways for medical professionals today? Sure. you know in one of the recent studies that we have done elizabeth we found out that almost 9 out of 10 healthcare professionals have some degree of sleep problems right and if we are able to improve that sleep then it it carries a cascade of changes in a positive way what we offered to improve that is try and see if we are able to rest our mind consciously for a few minutes at least in the morning and at night we offered heartfulness relaxation uh, to our physicians and advanced practice providers it does not take much time and this simple act of trying to relax the trying to rest the mind has yielded so beautifully so many positive positive results 
And based on how much time we have, if we are able to utilize that time in a proper way, it would lead to a cascade of positive changes. And I also tell our residents that it, it is a skill. It is not a skill. It is about uh, trying to be with the best within our own selves. It's, it's, a, it's an opportunity to spend that time to fuel ourselves. And if we're able to fill ourselves with that fuel and a time comes when we are connected with that source of that fuel and it may be much easier to navigate through ups and downs of life. So I would strongly recommend the simple practices that we offered, which have shown that it would help the well-being of healthcare professionals. Thank you, Jay. Elizabeth, how about you? What are your key takeaways? I, I want to, if I may, I just want to say first that, you know, as someone who, uh, who has spent most of her life from here to here, you know, I try to intellectualize everything, right? Um, you know, what, what I have to offer is very well aligned with the academic frameworks that exist within medicine. What Dr. Jay is talking about is really embodied practice, something that is a growing edge for me, something that I have you know, worked very hard on. And I can't uh, over, overstate how important I think what he's doing is. Um, you know, I, I, so, you know, one of, the, one of the stories I like to tell with respect to um, my, my, my changeover from, this, from the secular to the spiritual is that I was really inspired um, by an experience I had relating to uh, Albert Einstein. Um, I had actually heard a rabbi talking about the expanding universe. And that same week, uh, the science television program, Nova, featured a whole you know, uh, episode about the expanding universe. And I've never forgotten, it was a very simple demonstration, but it, it captured my imagination. They had a scientist inflating a simple, like a children's balloon with stickers on it to demonstrate how the galaxies are moving farther apart because the black part of outer space is actually getting bigger, right? And that was it, <clears throat> that was it for me. I mean, that, that sense of limitlessness, you know, that, that infinity actually has a beyond has stayed with me always. So this is a very kind of uh, out there construct of limitlessness and inspiration and awe, but it can also happen all the way in here. And I had a very similar experience when Dr. Jay first described his uh, meditation research findings to me. <laughs> I think my exact words might have been like, "Are you kidding me?" How oh, about the diopter lengthening? Uh, so, so it can happen both ways. And so, my takeaway really is, on an individual level, find what speaks to you. Maybe identify your growing edges. What, what, what is what is a little bit uncomfortable for you, and see if you can stretch right? And, and trust that process. Uh, and I will also tell you very plainly that in my opinion, no amount of narrative medicine and no amount of mindful practice is going to alleviate anyone's frustration with some of the structural things that happen uh, in healthcare um, that overtake people's lives. You know, we have physicians, their Saturday night date is their paperwork, right? Uh, you know, that this is what, this is what uh, they're sitting in their pajamas. This is before the pandemic, uh, doing paperwork on a Saturday night that needs to stop. You know, they did not go to school for that many years to do clerical work constantly. Right. So, so it's, it's, it's going to have to be a very synergistic coordinated eff effort on many, many different kinds of fronts. But I think that the, the narrative medicine practices and the, um, the, the, the mindfulness work can be a very important component to that. I think it has to be organizational and I think it needs to be nourishing. It needs to be physically, emotionally, psychologically, and spiritually nourishing. Um, you know, part of, part of professional development, uh, room needs to be made for it. And, um, and, and, and they should be incentivized, you know, with continuing education credit and nutritious food and, you know, a happy atmosphere, you know, in a very, in, a, in an environment that, um, that is supported by administrations, right? And not positioned at an administrative remove. Um, 
I would say that narrative medicine practice and, and mindful practice too can be attached to rounds. It can be part of a half day retreat. It can happen, an, an institution can make a commitment. We're gonna do this together four times a year. And ideally what I would like to see is it well facilitated by people who know how to hold space in groups and stop people from trying to fix each other, right? And I would love to see a, uh, an, a mix of business suits and scrubs and plain clothes with lanyards, uh, you, know, a, you know, true inter interdisciplinary work to, to, to promote understanding across, across the institution. Fantastic. I'm sure both of you will be at the forefront of this and continuing to inspire others in your field. So thank you both so, so much for this. I hope it's inspired others to look at what you're both doing and take up some of these practices that you're recommending. Elizabeth, do you have any contact details you'd like to share with the, the listeners? Sure, at I this will stage? Uh, share my screen. So I can be reached okay. at email addresses and my website is theburnoutchaplain.com. I welcome any questions or comments or feedback. I wanna thank you so much for having me and so much for facilitating this. Dr. J, it's an absolute pleasure to partner with you and to everyone on the team who helped make this event happen. This is such important, these are such important conversations to be having, especially now. Thank you so much. Likewise, it's an honor to be with you. Yes, that was wonderful. Thank you very much and good day to everyone. Thank you. Thank you.